Well, the thing I was very happy to hear about Manjushri, <coughs> what the guy had said about Manjushri, Manjushri is considered to be just like Avalokiteshvara and Tara. Avalokiteshvara is considered to be a bodhisattva who embodies the <coughs> compassion, the universal compassion of all Buddhas. Manjushri and Tara is considered to be the bodhisattva who embodies the miraculous activity, the female is that miraculous activity of all Buddhas. And Vajrapani is considered to be when Sambhav incarnates the power of all Buddhas, the competency, in the sense of competency, not in the sense of omnipotence. The um, Madhushri is considered to embody the transcendent wisdom of all Buddhas uh, in a male form. And then the female counterpart is Saraswati, which means the uh, you know, flowing poetry or something. So that's an art. One is sort of language. It's depicted holding the Transcendent Wisdom Sutra and a sword of critical analytic wisdom. And he has a very fierce form. He has many forms. All of those books up have many forms. Because, like, because actually they are Buddhas. In previous lives they became Buddhas. And so they manifest in many, many embodiments simultaneously. This is an odd thing for Westerners to get because of the idea of the soul embodiment of God, you know, that you have in the Judeo-Christian tradition. Uh, but in the Buddhist tradition, the enlightened being has infinite numbers of emanations. And whatever, in the verse of Mark Tisrael said, whatever educates whomsoever is the polite way of putting it. And the more literal way, whatever tames, <coughs> because the unenlightened person, the ego-centered driven person, is something like a little wild. So then taming means where they're no longer the slave of their egos, but they are actually aware of the, as in the feminine, they're more aware of their environment and what's around them. And they're not driven from some inner prompting that they can't control. So they're tamed. So, okay, so, so, <laughs> so what do we do this afternoon? I have various texts to read. Oh, but maybe I'll read, I'll read the 21 Taras, the miraculous activities, the female. I thought that would be appropriate today. If I did that. But in a way, I don't know. Does anybody have any questions? Or we've had the guide. How about the unguided me? <laughs> Does anybody have any question that they were that from, la from what you heard last night? I mean, some of you I see were not here last night, but you're really here now. Do you have any questions for me that you would like to uh, ask, or directions you would like me to go to? Sort of where all I'm really capable of is talking about sort of the Buddhist view about about the. Uh, you know, the divine feminine and what that means, you know, the, which takes us to Prajna Paramita. And so what I have on the computer here, I was looking up the ten night goddesses. And somehow nowadays I'm very involved with in my mind with what's called the Flower Ornament Sutra, which is a very huge thing in, in English translation from Chinese. It is fifteen hundred some pages long, and it, has, it contains many sutras. Sutra means like a discourse of the a discourse of the like being. And uh, but this sutra has a special vision, which you could call the holographic vision of the universe. And um, another subtitle of that sutra, an alternative title, is called the inconceivable liberation. So it's very very magical. And uh, it's, uh, you know, it's like a person in that liberation can swallow supernovas. <laughs> I mean, it's really distortion of dimension and energies and, you know, it's extraordinary. I mean, the other Mahayana Sutras have that, like the Vimalakirti Sutra has that. 
But this one is like a holographic view. And the famous simile that is that is the simile of the Avatamsaka, of the Flower Ornament Sutra, the Garland Sutra, is that uh, uh, the jewel net of Indra. And Indra in the Indian uh, imaginary, in the Indian, co Indian cosmos, is like Zeus. He's the king of the gods of Olympus, of the Indian Olympus, uh, which relates to Mount Kailash. And uh, in his city, the divine city there on top of the axial mountain, there's a net of jewels. And the nature of the net of jewels is that each jewel reflects all the other jewels. So if you look at any one of the jewels, you can see all the others reflected. But the end, therefore, all the others depend on each jewel being exactly in its position and with exactly its facets. So that sort of everything is contained all the atoms of the universe are contained in each atom of the universe, like a hologram. And all Buddhas are contained in every being in the universe, whether enlightened or unenlightened. And yet each one is sort of unique in their place. And it's therefore extraordinary, kind of extraordinary vision. And in the, the sort of pattern of the sutra is that the Buddha teaches different assemblies in all of the different human and heavenly realms in the cosmos. And he teaches 52 stages where, where you become, as a bodhisattva, you seek to reach this full enlightenment, which I described to people last night. And it's not really, a, it's not a religious thing, it's just a thing that, where as a sentient being, you go beyond the special gift, and here I'm repeating a little bit from those who weren't here, you go beyond the special gift of the human being compared to other animal forms, in that the human being is not really hardwired. The human being is very programmable and deprogrammable and reprogrammable, which is why education is so critical for human beings. The human being is extremely flexible. A mass murderer can become a saint, actually. And a total saint can never regress to become a mass murderer, actually. But some nice people can actually, under extreme circumstances, become very evil. Because the human being can go back and forth very hugely, which is why, in the human life form, this taming and education process is so critical. Because we really are formed by what we learn, by what we know, by what we think, by what we believe. Our worldview is very powerful in shaping how we are. You know, our, our, we, are we have a fantastic computer which is not just in the brain, it's the whole body is the brain. There's a nervous system that, you know, all the chakras, you know, means the brain of the entire body. And we have this marvelous system that can be programmed to be divine, actually, and extraordinary, and magical, and, you know, enlightened, become fully enlightened, which means completely wise, completely blissful, completely compassionate, because identifying with all beings in such a way that we feel all beings are us. And so anyone who feels bad, it becomes imperative to us to help them feel better when we become Buddhas. Or we can, get, we can fall off the, the, the high plateau, the mountain top of being a human being, of having worked up through evolution of the infinite beginning of lives to become human, which we also have done before, and then we didn't get beyond to become enlightened, so now we're just ordinary humans. And I mean, some of you may be enlightened, I don't know, but mostly we're ordinary humans. But, uh, or we can use the human platform to become fully enlightened and therefore never, never fall backward, never have a problem. You know, join, the, join the winning team, let's say. Become the solution team, not the problem team. So, uh, so in that light, uh, it is our possibility to become this kind of greatly compassionate and greatly wise being. And in that light, as I told them, to keep it, not to wander off it too far into that ocean of things that is involved with the, the many, many Buddhist traditions, actually, not just the one, but to bring it back to the divine feminine, to our context. Within that light, scientifically within Buddhist psychology and biology. The female form within the human forms is superior to the male form because the female form 
is more capable of expanding her identification to, incorporate, to completely be one with other beings than the male is. You know, the female has the other being in its body, you know, or even like quintuplets, <laughs> a, whole, a whole hockey team, right? <laughs> if, they, if they mess around too much with, uh, you know, too much high tech gene manipulation. So, the, so the, but and also generally, empathetically, females can be more easily empathetic. Males can also be, but females more easily. So that is, they have achieved a form. Although, ironically, that's hard to perceive in the history of Buddhism, because Buddha, Buddhism was working within one of the, although it was the foremost, probably, in Eurasia, of the civilization streams, which was the great Mahabharata stream, the great Indian stream which was the wealthiest and most, most advanced stream, you know, more than China, more than Persia, more than uh, Egypt or Greece or Mesopotamia or, of course, backward Europe. Europe was really backward. And they were running around drinking beer and knocking females over the head with clubs in the German woods, you know. And the English, I don't know what to say about that, <laughs> you know, with their terrible food. <laughs> and, uh, 